Um, we're going to be having Eric first, you'll have 10 minutes, and then Paul again will have 10 minutes to finish the debate. Eric. You raised a, a number of points, and I'm not going to address all of them, I'll address the ones that are easiest. <laughs> <laughs> um, for example, the, uh, it was Duncan made the ask, actually, well, you want to, when you're asking a question, if the Georgians owed their experiment to the Bolsheviks having taken power, yes and no. Uh, Georgia became largely independent of Russia in February, which the Tsar's regime collapsed and evaporated, and the Viceroy handed the keys and got on the next you know, train out of Georgia. What the Bolsheviks managed to do was convince the Georgians, the Armenians, and the Azerbaijanis to pull out of the Russian Empire completely, formally, establish an independent state. Three independent states in the end, which uh, the Bolsheviks recognized and then invaded. Um, I think you also made the point that, that the Bolsheviks, and so several of you men pulling into the Bolsheviks, kind of embracing the Soviets, representing the Soviets, and leading the Soviets, again and again. And yet, I know I, I keep taking this beyond 1917, but it's just time. <laughs> this meeting is not being held in January 1918. It's 100 years later. We're allowed to know what happened next. What happened next was the Bolsheviks gutted the Soviets. They gutted them. And when, and when the last free elections of the Soviets were taking place around 1921, actually the opposition parties, including the Mensheviks, did exceptionally well. And then the Soviets were crushed completely. So though you may think they came to power to make the Soviets see that all powerful institutions are reality, they destroyed them. As several people have mentioned, the, the risk, the risks they were taking. Now obviously, anyone active in politics, we take risks. We know that. Risks are fine. There's something called risk assessment. You evaluate how, what, how badly could this go wrong? What could happen? What's, you know, as they say in the TV end, right? What's the worst that could happen? Well, in the Russian Revolution, some people think, and some people I think in this room think, the worst that could have happened would have been a restoration of capitalism. Now, first of all, that's weird because there was no capitalism. There was no bourgeois regime in Russia. It really wasn't, and never had been. The greatest risk was not a return to capitalism, but a return to feudalism. It was a return to something that had never existed before. It was a return to an autocratic regime with all the blessings of modern technology and a ruthlessness that the Tsarist regime never had. Stalinism, the new society, with the late Max Shackman, just called bureaucratic collectivism, that was the risk. And my points about Plakhanov and Saul would indicate that it's not me, 100 years later, telling them cleverly that was a risk we took. They were told this in the debates on nationalization of land and the premature seizure of power a decade before the revolution. They debated this openly. This was the time when they could debate everything openly. Mensheviks and Bolsheviks together could discuss, well, what happens? And they, by, by the way, they relied heavily on Marx and Engels, who did discuss what happens when a class takes power before its time. And there were examples of that. And it was described by Marx and Engels as a great tragedy. I think it was Ben discussed um, the democratic decisions that preceded the seizure of power. Now, there was plenty of democracy happening in Russia prior to the October Revolution. I don't doubt that. I don't deny that. I accept that. There were loads of discussions and debates and everything open. The actual decision to seize power and to create the Soviet, the uh, Council of People's Commissars, was a decision made in the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party. A stark fact. That was not a decision taken by the Congress of Soviets, which hadn't even met yet. It was a decision taken in that, and it, was, and it could have gone the other way. If it was an only even comment if it persuaded four or five other members, they wouldn't have done it. And they had many reasons that our historians analyze why did the Bolsheviks decide at that moment to seize power. Lenin didn't want to seize power early. He didn't want to wait for the Congress of Soviets. Um, Dan, I, I, I like you too. I'm going to pick that out and put that out. Um, I, uh, I dedicated my book, which will be available on sale on September 15th. Um, to Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had known. No, the, the book is dedicated to, among others, Max Shackman. Because um, the Max Shackman that, that, that I respect is because the whole of Max Shackman. <laughs> from, his, from his early years, as a great revolutionary, to his mature years when he rethought Bolshevism and drew some correct conclusions. Um, and, yes, opportunist is probably a bad word. I was using it in the sense of uh, the Bolsheviks seized an opportunity. And the opportunity was not that millions of workers were calling them to seize power. I don't believe that was the case. The opportunity was that they were up against a, a feeble, weak regime that, as history proves, could be toppled by basically a handful of red guards pouring into the Winter Palace. All those wonderful movie scenes you've seen, of the storming of the Winter Palace, of course, are fictional. The scenes of millions of workers in the streets are from February. In October, there were not millions of workers in the streets. I don't think Paul will dispute this. The masses in the streets 
came at various points during the year. The night the Bolshevik seized power was not a night of mass street demonstration. It was a precise military operation coordinated by the Military Revolutionary Committee of the Petrograd Soviet under the command of Trotsky, launched at the initiative of the Bolshevik Central Committee. Um, I want to spend the rest of my minute. Oh, no, no, me five minutes. I got five minutes is too much time. I want to talk about. Don't take it all. No, I'm going to take it all. Every minute. <laughs> It's such a bullshit thing to say, you don't need to talk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> sit down now. This is, this is not the Congress of Soviets. Um, I want to discuss what Marx said, because in a sense, what most people have said tonight, you know, um, I think you said you've heard me a number of times. Sasha's heard me a number of times. You've heard me a number of times. I've heard you a number of times. We kind of know what each other's going to say. We can actually just raise hands and say, you know, number 14. <laughs> and you sit down, I know, I know what you're going to say. But what Marx said was, was genuinely new to me here, because what Marx essentially said, and I, I maybe rephrasing it to make you sound worse than you actually are, but I think you sort of said, looking at things like the checkup and banning newspapers, you can kind of understand why they would have done it. Why a revolutionary group, a revolution that takes power, may have to create a, a political police and in the middle of the Civil War and so on. Now, to me, this is what I was talking about, revolutionary morality. Because the first meeting I ever attended of workers' liberty, I think, back when some of us were very young and really good looking, um, <laughs> w was talking about the Yugoslav War, a Kosovo. And Sean went into Old Prophet mode, Old Testament Prophet mode, he sometimes does, and talked about how groups like the Socialist Workers' Party had lost their moral compass. I never forgot the phrase. I never heard it before. To me, to speak about the Cheka in any terms other than to utterly condemn this institution from day one, for its brutality, its mass murders of innocent people, and the stain it put on Bolshevism and on socialism, how you could not 100% blanket condemn that, and instead say, well, you kind of have to understand why they would do that. I think there is a loss of moral compass here. It's not a personal accusation. I think it flows from, mm -hmm. you know, you, you want to back, you want to back the Bolsheviks because everybody wants to be Bolshevik. Everybody thinks the Bolsheviks were really, I mean, they really did a real revolution. They really went out there and did it. I get that. I get the romantic appeal of the Bolsheviks. I'm inspired by them. There were wonderful people who became Bolsheviks. In the course of the Bolshevik Revolution, magnificent things were done. I know that. We all know that. We see it in literature and in art and some of the measures taken there. Great things were done. Of course they were. And millions of people over the decades of course, we into the communist movement, but we are better than that. We who came out of the Trotskyist movement, who came out of the Fourth National, knew that the communist movement was poisoned by what the Bolsheviks did, by what Stalin did. I'm just taking it back a couple of years. Paul's book begins by saying we're going to talk about the 10 years that Russia had, those wonderful 10 years of revolution. 10? I wouldn't say one. The Red Terror is in the first year. The Cheka is in the first year. The Gulag is in the first year. You read Solzhenitsyn, the Gulag Archipelago, the first volume, the first <coughs> chapter talks about, let's not talk about 1937, let's talk about 1917. And he's absolutely right. And this is what we have to learn as revolutionaries. To be completely honest about this. Lenin and the Bolsheviks from day one create institutions like the Cheka that are morally reprehensible and cannot be defended by a, by a socialist. You can't call yourself a socialist and say the Cheka and the Red Terror were, were okay things. They were terrible things. They're unjustifiable. I would never be in a party and do such a thing. If, if I was in a party, I would repudiate it. Completely and utterly. And Zerzhinsky was a murdering scum who was followed by people who were infinitely worse than him. And it was built into the system. The Czech would attract the absolute worst people to lead it. All the crimes that we think about, we think about the Soviet Union, all the worst things they did were done by Zerzhinsky and his successors. That to me is absolutely indefensible, as is the suppression, particularly the mention of the party both in the Soviets and their press, and the left Mensheviks, and the Menshevik internationalists, and the Mensheviks who opposed the war, and the Mensheviks who were Marxists and revolutionaries like Markov, they were all suppressed. They were all suppressed. Only one party ruled. Only one party ruled against all other socialist parties and crushed the law. That's indefensible. It's morally indefensible. Okay, uh, I'm going to have a bash at Georgia.